Well, my name is David Morrill, and I am a recovering conspiracy theorist. I don't say that lightly. I'm a graduate student at Portland State University studying communication science with a focus on political communications, and I am obsessed with conspiracy theories. It's actually gotten into me into a little bit of trouble in the past, but we'll leave that up to your imagination. So everybody's probably getting moderately familiar with conspiracy theories given the quarantine. Everybody's on Facebook, everybody's on social media, and nobody knows what's going on. And so this confusion is a breeding ground, a real cesspool for conspiracy. And so why, in the first place, do conspiracy theories grab our attention? Well, primarily in my research, I have found that it is to assuage fears. It's to reduce fearfulness and to get back into control when there seems to be a lack thereof. Uh, so people use confirmation bias all the time, but with conspiracists, it's particularly strong. You may think your ideas are strange, but if you're very dedicated to upholding them, you'll remember the times in which you are proven correct far more vividly than the multitude of times that you are proven incorrect. And back to that uh, conception of fear, right? Right now, the coronavirus, the economy, uh, our political situation, everything around the globe is seemingly a big, horrid ocean of confusion. And so what a conspiracy theory does is it grants you little tiny stepping stones that you can lay out bit by bit in front of you to step across the ocean to pretend that everything is okay. So the beauty of conspiracy theories is that they don't really need to be right, and they don't really need to be concrete. They don't need to be specific, really, at all. Uh, really, the beauty of a conspiratorial thought is that it just needs to kind of prove that there's fuzziness or confusion around the edges of information. Um, by now, I'm pretty sure the majority of people here have heard the term or maybe even seen the video content, the merchants of doubt, right? And that's really what conspiratorial thought is. It's doubt. Witness lots of content online. You'll probably notice one emoji in particular. It's very insidious. It goes like this. Hmm, right? And you'll see that a lot of conspiracy theorists don't really peddle out anything concrete or specific. They make just people kind of come to their own conclusions. And these own conclusions are often things that people, if they're honest with themselves, are not experts in. But the idea that you are not an expert is unsettling. The idea that you don't know what you're talking about is unsettling. And so us as pattern beings, that seek sense-making constantly, we look for things to have patterns. We look for things to make sense. And we are desperate, desperate, desperate to try to make them so. Because as soon as they do make so, then everything is calmer, everything is better. And now let's get to the thing that's grounding my case studies in this term in graduate school. So in these tumultuous times of COVID-19, people are justifiably perturbed. But consequence consequently, Concern and uncertainty have seemingly been manifesting in the form of conspiratorial solutions to the pandemic. Strangely, people are associating the installation of fifth-generation telecommunications technology to the origin and the virulence of a disease. And never before have I seen a particular machination advance so quickly to the forefront of the web. Now I'll say I haven't concretely, exhaustively examined this yet. But cursory investigations suggest that the explosive growth of this theory is actually linked in part to government-sanctioned disinformation efforts. The motivations for this behavior are likely similar to the 2016 election meddling that has been written on far more extensively. And if anybody's interested, I'll have probably a close to 20 academic sources that I can email you. So conspiracies, right? They're kind of viral, which is prescient and salient given the pandemic that we're in. A conspiracy needs a host. It needs to breed inside a body. And back in ancient times, and even up until moderate re moderately recently, conspiracies existed, sure. But they were kind of relegated to the dustbins of history. They were the person on the street corner yelling profanities. And nobody really listened, because the audience wasn't really interested, right? It, it, was, it was crazy. Well, compliments of the internet and communities online, 
it's no longer the person that's just yelling on the street corner. Now every single person yelling on the street corner is actually all collaboratively engaging in digital communities. And so these conspiracies, like viruses, have found viable hosts with far more rapidity and success. And I've gotten the question repeatedly, like, yeah, okay, so, but what's, what's the consequence of this, right? There's always been conspiracies, and somebody made a very good point. There's actually been conspiracies that have been very, very deadly, like the Salem witch trials, right? Oh, you're a witch. Oh, you're a witch. Oh, you're a witch. And there's very little evidence, and the measures for discovering if they really were a witch or not were completely nonsensical. But a lot of people died, right? And so how are conspiracies on Facebook groups and Twitter and what have you of any significance compared to an event such as this? Well. Alarmingly, some experts suggest that these conspiracies are an element of economic warfare. And this is especially perturbing in a democracy, because a democratic nation's progress can be slowed if foreign powers create unease in voters. A politician in the US will be less inclined to advance 5G technology if it means losing the support of their constituents. Similarly, businesses will see less funding if demand lowers. This disruption permits less democratic regimes to advance unimpeded with infrastructure projects while slowing the development of other nations. Additionally, other experts are suggesting that putting targets on 5G masts or towers via these conspiracies can lead to something called stochastic terrorism. Basically just means random. Uh, it's a type of unpredictable but likely inevitable threat. And I can, again, show you countless sources that are showing that 5G masks have already begun being burned. In Europe, I think it was Great Britain specifically, some telecommunications lines were actually already cut to hospitals. And so you can see just how effective this kind of random stochastic methodology can translate into real damage. And beyond that, I must say, again, this is developing research. And I'd be happy to take your questions. I'm feverishly, exhaustively looking into this. I want to find solutions. I need to know how to combat this because it's a genuine nuisance, a genuine thorn. And it seems like autocratic regimes or totalitarian or things similar to this have a huge advantage and a leg up over dem democracies. We have been getting some new terms and some new studies and some new research to incorporate into fights back against this type of thing. Like I've just seen on Google Trends the term infodemic is being used as a quick reference so that people can access research on this topic rapidly. But beyond that, uh, really I'd love to take your questions. This is my life, I, I'm losing sleep over it and it's very, very challenging to observe.